We're going to be talking about one light photography, and my name's Dan Brulette. I live in Omaha, via New York City for a few years, and I'm originally from Iowa, so a lot of different experiences here. Uh, a lot of learning about light over the last 15 or so years when I started photography. So um, I know everybody wants to do lighting. Some people are intimidated by lighting. Other people have been doing lighting for years, and I just want to bring it all back to that first setup where you have one light. Um, I want to go over all the different ways you can use one light from harsh light to medium harsh light to very soft light. Uh, talk about light positions and some of the fundamentals and how you can manipulate those fundamentals to your advantage when using one light. Um, you know, even the image here, this was shot last time I was here at Creative Live, that was just one light. So um, I want to talk more about that and the range that you can pull in your photographs by just using one light and the occasional reflector, which does not count as a second light. So filling a little bit of shadow. So let's jump into it. Um, first, I'd like to thank these guys, White House Custom Color. They do all my printing, portfolios, and the works. And then Profoto, they're the suppliers of all these fun lights that we get to play with and all the modifiers as well, or almost all the modifiers. And they make great stuff, so I'm a big fan of theirs. Um, so the introduction to one light portrait photography. Here's the things we're going to cover. Uh, I want to go over the basic fundamentals. I'm a guy who believes in having a strong knowledge of the concept of lighting, knowing the fundamentals, so that way when you're in a situation that's different than your last, you can, you can adapt and change by knowing how the how the lights work from a conceptual level uh, and when you're moving things around and you know let's say you get to a shoot and it's not exactly what you thought uh, knowing how to adjust on the fly because you understand how everything works and why it works so we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, which will lead us into the equipment that I use I'll go over an equipment list of everything you guys are going to see me use up here today and then everything that's in my kit back home that I take on my shoots when I'm doing one light type of shoots uh, we'll also cover dramatic looks, so these will be more harsh, harsh lights with a lot of shadow, a lot of specularity, real hard light. We'll then cover everyday portraits. What I mean by that is kind of your more flattering lights that, or your more flattering looks that end up looking similar to a window light and things like that. We'll be using large soft sources, so from dramatic looks to more everyday nice soft looks. Uh, we'll then go over a conclusion of you have some ideas I have for how to expand your own knowledge on lighting, how, to, how you can use one light out in the field, on location, things like that. Um, and that'll pretty much do it. We're going to have a model in here. We're going to go through about four or five different setups quickly, just from you know, the hard light setup to alt alternatives you can do with that to the medium light and then moving on to the soft light. And again, throwing in that reflector to fill in that shadow and how you don't need a second light even when you think you do. Uh, because you can, you can do a lot with just a piece of white foam core, V-flat, uh, anything you have, really a piece of paper if you come down to it. Let's get started. So for me, like I said already once, the fundamentals are huge. Uh, when it comes to the fundamentals, the first thing I like to think about in any lighting setup, and this is true for any job, no matter how big or small, if it involves lights, my first thought is light quality. So quick story, um, I lived in New York 2009, 10, 11, 12 to 13, and I assisted a lot of photographers. And one of the photographers I assist, assisted, she's one of my really good friends, her name's Victoria Will. She taught a class here last year, the year before, but we worked on a lot of shoots, like hundreds of shoots together. And my only job, she ran the camera and, and got the job. My, my job was to, to do the lighting. And that was awesome for me because being a kind of a technical nerd, I like thinking about that stuff. But as soon as you have a subject in front of the camera or you have to have that relationship, you need to focus on them. And knowing that she had that part handled and that was her job, I could just mess with the lighting to make sure it was perfect. And any job that she got where I was in charge of lighting, the first, and this is true for any job that I get as well, my first thought is, what quality of light do I want? Is this going to be a job that requires hard light? Is this going to be a job that requires soft light? Those are my first, that's my first thought, because um, one year I got hired to shoot team pictures for the Minnesota Vikings. Going through lighting diagrams in my head, instantly going to hard light. We have these football players, they're in full pads, they're on the field. That's not going to call for a 60-inch umbrella with a diffusion. You don't, that's not going to fit the mood, so I don't need to bring that equipment. Um, I need to prepare for what I actually need, and that was hard light. So it's like, all right, we're going to use something like a magnum reflector or even bare bulb flash, and what am I going to use to fill that type of light? So is it going to be reflector or what else? So 
no matter what the job, light quality is always my first, first thought. My second thought is lighting position. Um, I know I've, I've covered this in other courses, but I can't say it enough. Um, I believe there's three, three main things about your lighting position. One of them is the height of your light. So, and just specifically think about one light today. So lighting position is key in that a lot of people who shoot natural light, our favorite time to shoot is either early morning, if you're a morning person, or that golden hour right before sunset. And the, the similarities between those two times a day are that the sun is in the exact same position in the sky. Both times, it's if you uh, get one of those apps on your phone where it tells you sun angles, it's roughly 35 degrees above the horizon. So, you know, if you're looking straight ahead, go 35 degrees up, that's gonna be your light position of the sun and why you like shooting at that time uh, is because of the light quality. I try and mimic that same angle when I'm shooting in the studio. So my lighting position is always at about that 35 degrees. There's times where you break the rules and you try different stuff. But generally speaking, that's my lighting position for my one, my main light. Uh, you know, if you start with your lights too low, you start to underlight people's chins and noses. That's not flattering at all. You get weird catch lights low in the eye. It makes people look cross-eyed, not, not awesome. And if your light's up too high above that position, you're going to start to lose catch lights because brow bones and eyelashes and things like that will block your catch lights completely. So uh, I like to start with that lighting position of the height. Um, the next lighting position that I focus on is... Um, the angle of the light, you know, how much shadow do you want to introduce to the face? Because with every light, it's going to cast a shadow somewhere. So I, I always think in terms of a radius in front of my subject with me being at the peak of that radius. So let's say I'm photographing you guys and there's this light radius out here. The closer my lights are to the side, the more shadow it's going to push. So then you start thinking about fill and all that type of stuff. And, and it always goes back to the purpose. Why are you lighting this photo? Is it, are you trying to get an upbeat mood? Are you trying to light something dramatic? You know, and by choosing your light quality, you already are kind of halfway there. So I'm always thinking about my height and then where my light is relative to my subject and where that shadow is going to fall, where the shadow side is going to be. Um, and then the next thing I think about is where I'm going to, how I'm going to position that light. A lot of lights have different qualities coming out of them, whether it's uh, a big umbrella like this giant Pro Photo XL here where it has nice soft light. I like to position people near the edges so you get that wraparound effect to really, you know, that's giving us soft light, so why not make it the softest possible if we're gonna go there? So I put people near the edges so you get that wraparound effect where if you're lighting somebody with a zoom reflector or bare bulb reflector or something like that, you wanna aim it right at them because you're trying to get that specularity. You're not trying to feather and get soft light. So we'll use both of those and I'll show you how I do it. Um, the photo here on the screen was just the bare bulb. We're gonna recreate that look today on the white seamless with our model Joe and uh, get something similar only with a guy's perspective to it. So it'll be a little different. Uh, the next thing I do is I meter. I have my light meter, it's sitting right here. I use it all the time because I believe that having a sloppy photo adds a lot more work on the back end where if you could just meter and get the exposure right in camera, you'll save yourself a lot of time and headache of blown exposures, highlights, shadows, the whole work. So you'll see I'm always pulling out the meter and taking my trigger off my camera to meter because I just think that's really important, and I love when I tether to see a nice clean photo on the screen and not one that has to use a bunch of adjustments in RAW. So if you can start there, you give yourself a lot more latitude for adjustments later. Um, so moving forward, um, this is just a sample image. Another one, one light portrait. It, this was, believe it or not, these two shots were the exact same light. I was holding in the little Profoto B2 bulb. That one I was just holding it over my camera. Exact, oh, oops, went back too far exact same thing here. The only difference is black and white and he's sitting on an apple box. So it's the same light and we'll show you how we move the light around to cast the shadow because you can be really purposeful with where you're putting the shadow, uh, you know, whether you want it at all or where you want it to go by just moving your light a little bit here or there. So we'll go over that. And then some about the equipment that I use. Uh, I I'm a big fan of the Pro Photo stuff. As you saw, I had their logo up earlier. Um, we'll, we'll introduce the equipment real quick. So one of the setups we're gonna use is with the Pro Photo B1s. In fact, I'm just gonna bring them out a little bit so they're out of frame for the next shot. Uh, this is just the Silver Deep umbrella. I think this is a medium. Yep, and it has, you know, when you're thinking about quality of light, silver means specular, and your white will be your soft light. So I wanna, I wanna do the full range today. So we're gonna go from this bare bulb look to this silver look where you have a larger light source, but it's still pretty harsh. And then we're gonna move on to the other Pro Photo, which is the XL umbrella with the diffusion on it. So this is the same, same type of thing, but it's just a soft silver interior 
with this diffusion. So the, the light actually fires into the umbrella, the light bounces back through the diffusion, the diffusion fabric, knocks off about a stop and a half, but it gives you a really nice soft light. So we're going to get the full range there. Um, so I'm a huge fan of the B1s because I'm not a huge fan of cords. I don't like cords running around the floor. I like to keep everything clean because I don't, I'm looking through the camera the whole time. I don't want to trip on things. And a lot of times uh, when I'm shooting on location or in someone else's studio or anywhere where there might not be power, I don't want to have to rely on an out, you know, there being this miraculous outlet out in the woods for me to plug a light into. I'd rather rely on, on my own batteries and be a little self-sufficient with the power. So I'm a big fan of the Pro Photo lights that have batteries because then I don't have to worry about power. Um, the other pieces of equipment that I bring with me, um, soft light umbrella. So whether you use the Pro Photo ones or also the Fotec, they're you know pretty inexpensive alternative. They open just like any other umbrella. They have the diffusion sock similar to the Pro Photo, and you know they make them in 36, 46, or 60 inches, and at you know probably an average price of 90 bucks a piece. If you break one, it's not the end of the world. In fact, they just improved them and made fiberglass rods inside the umbrella, so that you don't. It's even one less thing to break than bending the metal. So. They're a solid alternative to the Pro Photo lights and a little less expensive uh, for a similar quality product. Uh, I also love zoom reflectors and magnum reflectors. For those of you not familiar, zoom reflectors, basically, uh, this is just a seven inch reflector, but zoom reflectors will have a different texture in here. They actually magnify the light. There's a zoom, oh, there's a zoom on the floor. Here we go. Thanks, John. Uh, as you can see, they have a different texture where they actually magnify the light, and depending on how far you place this on the head of your light, it can focus uh, the beam more, or have a narrow focus or a wide focus, and there's a little guide here. But I love working with these to kind of give directional light using one light. And they also have grids that go on there so you can control it. Um, same with the Magnum Reflector, it's just a giant version of this. That uh, It's a good light if you're outdoors or somewhere where you're trying to mimic sunlight where, when it's not sunny. You can put a warmer gel on there throw a magnum reflector up in the air and you have yourself a fake sunlight. So that works really well too. And then lastly, the beauty dish. Uh, everybody knows what a beauty dish is in case for some reason you don't. It is basically a 20 inch metal bowl of sorts. Big reflector, has a diffusion piece inside it so it is indirect light, it bounces off the back of that, goes into the dish and then this is a grid. I like to control my beauty dish. I don't like a lot of light spill. Uh, we'll show you why when we get shooting but the grid fits nicely inside the lip of your beauty dish. And a lot of the Profoto uh, modifiers have grids specifically made for their size. So whether it's a seven inch reflector, a beauty dish, a magnum, things like that, um, grids are awesome and you can diffuse them and anything you wanna do. So this is kind of the more dramatic looks. Uh, this was actually shot with one light. This was a, the Magnum reflector. I had someone hand holding it just off the side of the camera. You could do a light stand. That would be a little easier if you don't have an assistant. But it's just, again, purposefully knowing where the shadow is going to be cast. So it was one light. Um, we'll talk about fall off. I, the, I lit this once, and her hands went dark. And we'll talk about how to position your light, how fall off works using the inverse square law and all that fun stuff. To, uh, to really control your light and the fall off. Um, and you know, dramatic looks are usually created with this directional hard light. I love, you know, a lot of people look at hard light and they cringe, but I think that's just because they're using the wrong light for the wrong subjects. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to light anything. It's just as long, you know, this is a girl in a pretty dress up against a blue wall. You would normally think, oh, I want nice soft light. But for some reason, she just had this edge to her and I wanted to really saturate that blue and have that shadow. So placing her against the wall and using that hard light was, was a way to really bring out the blues. Um, her face could handle the specularity and harshness of the light. So, you know, while normally I would think, oh, girl in a dress in this situation would use the big pro photo umbrella, no, I went the other way and used the silver reflector and I really liked the results. It was just something different, trying things. I'm all about experimenting with, with different lighting I'll, I'll take specific days for myself. It doesn't have to be the most creative shoot in the world, but anytime I go into a shoot, something is bound to go wrong. Whether the talent is not so great, whether the location is less than what they told you, uh, maybe a light breaks or, or you know something happens, the ceiling is six foot tall, who knows? 
there's a lot of different things that happen in shoots where I like to kind of go over those scenarios in my own studio, play with lighting so that way when I'm on a job with a client and something happens that's not ideal, I don't have a panic attack. It's like, okay, well we practice this. Uh, it's kind of like doing a tornado drill. You know, you never think the tornado is going to happen. And unfortunately on photo shoots you get a lot of tornadoes. So they, uh, something always comes up and I have to jump into the bag of tricks and being comfortable with these different situations and playing with lights in my own time helps out when, uh, when things aren't going ideal. Um, embrace the shadow and contrast. I have a lot of people, especially, I don't know, some, a couple of photographers who have seen images like this and they say, yeah, but what about the shadow? And I say, well, you tell me, what about the shadow? What, why does that bother you? And they, it's, it might not be the traditional look that they're expecting from this, but it evoked a, you know, some sort of reaction from them. And it's a technically solid image, so I don't mind that there's a shadow. It's just another element to this. It adds, you know, we have this stark blue wall, this girl in a cream colored dress with blue, you know, the little blue flowers which pull from the blue, and then having that graphic element there of the shadow to kind of bring in that right third of the frame. To me, it just kind of completes the picture. So, you know, shadow or not, I'm, I'm all for like trying different things, and that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna show how, how I'll do a different type of shadow, whether it's up, down, left, or right with Joe on the white seamless here. So uh, if Joe's ready, we could bring him in. Oh, he is ready, because he's already in here. <laughs> all right, sweet. All right, here's Joe, guys. He's here. He's our model. Yeah. All right, so we're going to be shooting. Sorry, I cut off Joe's applause. No. <laughs> um, we're going to be shooting in studio, tethered, so you guys will be able to see the images. Uh, I'm going to do one test shot. We're going to do a lot of metering and technical stuff. I'll talk through everything from camera settings to light settings to modifiers. Uh, probably talk so much you'll be ready for me to stop talking when this is over. So. Let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about is the hard light with just the bare bulb type of look. So this is just a standard reflector on there. It's a 7-inch reflector. I'm going to leave that on to kind of control a little bit of the light spill. It's silver, so it has a specular quality. So we're going with really hard light. I think it'll fit the look we're going for, kind of this edgy look. I'm actually going to wheel the stand up, but I'm going to handhold the head of this light. So Joe, if you want to come right over here. And I'm going to keep him fairly close to the seamless, so that way we can, we can control the shadow. So don't lean back on it, because it's not touching the wall. We've had, I was on a shoot with, I don't remember who it was, somebody famous, and they thought it was a wall. And they ended up through the backdrop. <laughs> and I was doing everything I could. They weren't, they weren't hurt, but it was pretty funny. Um, and they didn't think it was as funny, but uh, one of those things. So now I warn people, it's like, this is not a wall. So if you just want to be really close to it, almost like heels touching this, so that way your shadow stays pretty close. Because the closer your subject is to the background, the closer the shadow is going to be to them within it, because there's just less space for that shadow to cast out. So we're going to start up the tether machine here. And I have my light meter. Um, this thing's always with me. It's just a little Sekonic light meter. And what I'm going to do is we're going to use the Profoto B2 to start. I know I showed you guys the B1s earlier. Oh, yeah, wrong button. Um, the reason I like using this for on-camera flash look is because the light head on, on the B2 is only a pound and a half. So if you're using something like the B1, you can hold that up there for like one shot. And I'm not planning on working out when I'm doing a photo shoot. So something like this that only weighs one to two pounds is a lot, a lot more manageable. So what I'm going to do is I'll give you the meter. Uh, generally speaking, shooting in studio, I want to be at ISO 100. I don't you're providing the light. Your camera doesn't need the extra sensitivity. So ISO 100, I don't want the ambient light to affect the shot. I want to make it as dark as possible so we can still work with all these lights on but have them not affect the frame. Second thing is maximum sync speed. I'm using a Nikon D810. We're going to be shooting at a 200th of a second. So that gives us two more variables. White balance, 5500 Kelvin. I always shoot in Kelvin on my white balance. Profoto lights are generally balanced at about 5500 or daylight. And then the last thing is your aperture. So that's the variable you get to choose. Um, with that, I'm going to just shoot at about f8. I like, I like shooting in studio at f8. It gives me a good depth of field as far as getting everything in focus. If there's any movement or anything like that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to maintain sharpness. And it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a good enough aperture to also keep the ambient light out. So f8, a 200th of a second, ISO 100 at 5500 Kelvin. Uh, so let's. We'll pop a flash here. I'm going to get over into where I'll actually be shooting because I'm actually going to be holding my camera and the light at the same time. 
So we'll hope for F8. I have no idea. This might be really bright. Seven and a third. Seven and a third. So we need to go up a third of a stop. The other thing I like about Pro Photo Lights is everything on the screen is in digital tenths of a stop. So if we need to go up a third of a stop, we just go up three clicks. One, two, three. I'll get approximately where I was before. We should be at eight this time. If not, I don't know what happened. Nine. Nine. Seven. So you can see it's pretty finicky. So we're going to call that close enough because I think we did it once and it was nine, the next time it was seven. It just depends on if I move, and chances are I'm going to be moving. Yeah, and that's the other thing to pay attention to when you're hand holding this. The first time you do it, uh, experiment, hold it like this, and slowly go down until you find the sweet spot that works for you. Everybody's a different height. So you'll see as I'm shooting, I'm going to do one test shot. I generally like to aim it down because I don't like to light up there. I want the fall off to hit him on the hands and light more of the body. So just stand about how you are. I'm not going to do a whole lot of posing with this. We're just going to kind of shoot and, and go from there. I'm going to get uh, about waist up. So we're going to watch. This should just cast a shadow directly behind him. One, let me focus. One, two, three. One more. Something. There we go. One, two. Okay. So we're just going for, you know, that on camera flash, poppy, specular look. Uh, when I'm shooting in raw, the one thing I like to do is flatten out my images when I start working on them. Well, we can do it in curves too. We'll just bring down the highlights a little bit, bring up the shadows. And, and I like to start with a nice flat image because when I'm doing any of my Photoshop work, I like to add my contrast in there through color toning and everything else. So starting with a flat image from the get-go helps me, helps me work uh, in Photoshop later because it gives me a little more latitude with contrast. So I'm not blowing out highlights and shadows from the start. I can kind of push the images a little bit further then. I want to move his shadow now to one side or the other like I showed you with the other images. So you're going to stay in the exact same spot. The only difference is I'm going to keep my light tilted. So you'll be looking right here, but I'm going to move it out. So we're just kind of moving around that radius I talked about earlier to create a little more contrast. So you'll notice he'll now have a no shadow. Rather than this, it's pretty flat. He'll, his shadow will cast out to the right. And we can kind of create a little bit more dynamic image by just placing the light slightly off to one side. And we could do the exact same thing to the other. Uh, I'm going to get in a little closer, which means I'm just going to stop up. Um, so we'll go from F9 or F8 to 10 just because I moved in. I'm going to have you, if you can lean back just a little bit. Yeah, there you go. It's, it's just from the chest up. So I just want to cast that shadow out even, even further. Uh, there we go. And then we'll get back and we'll do the exact opposite. We'll make another flat one for comparison. So we're going to stop back down to F8, and boom. So we have that nice flat image. Uh, let me change the curve here just a little bit on it. And then what you can see is, obviously here, his face is much brighter. So this is where I say you can angle that light down. If, if you want your subject or your background to be more evenly lit, uh, for anybody not familiar with the inverse square law, basically the further you are, from your subject, the brighter your background is going to be. So why don't you step out real quick? This is a good time to, to talk about this. Uh, if I sh let's we'll meter real quick. I'm going to meter for Joe's forehead to be properly exposed. All right. So we're not going to change anything. Just going to try for f8. So throw that up there. Boom. What are we at? Nine. Nine. So we'll go down. Uh, we'll go down a couple clicks here to get as close to eight as possible because I think this is pretty important. And a lot of people ask me that. I have a white background, but I can't figure out how to make it white and they only have one light. Seven. seven. All right. Well, it's just bouncing between nine and seven. So we're going to call it good. So I'm going to shoot from right here and you're going to watch as the background goes gray compared to the previous shot. So the background is going gray. If I want it to get brighter, a lot of people think, oh, I need to move the light closer to the backdrop. Well, guess what? That's the opposite of what you need to do because now I'm closer to his forehead, which means, I, which means I need to up my exposure or turn down the power of the light. So you'll watch, if I shoot this, we're still going to shoot at F8. Every image is going to be shot at F8, just so you guys notice. Um, meter that real quick. We're going to shoot from about point blank here. Uh, let, me, let me get a beat on this. It's going to be bright. Sorry, Joe. Sorry, 16. Man. So you see, I need to go down a lot. So we need to go down two stops. Uh, let's try this. I'm going to close your eyes. Testing. Boom. Seven. Seven. So we're pretty darn close. So, I mean, we're talking about movements of inches here. So now you'll see how much grayer the background gets. See, I moved the light closer. Now the last thing I want to do is move way back. We're going to, I already know the light's going to have to go up. So we're going to continue to shoot at F8. Uh, we'll give a test fire here. 
Boom. Eight. Eight. Perfect. So I'm going to shoot from right here, and you're going to watch my background will get significantly lighter. And that's, uh, see, nothing else happened. That's the inverse square law at work, basically saying, and that's actually my favorite shot of the whole works. So um, we kind of found a sweet spot there between the light, the background, and everything else. So I like to play this little experiment game where you see where everything balances. So many people ask me, well, I have this white background. Um, or, or they'll text me and say, or email and say, which gray seamless should I order? I don't have gray seamless. I only have white. Because if I want gray seamless, take a step towards me, like way out here. I don't even, we're going to do, uh, let's go back up to, so now we're moving him away from the background, but I'm going to move closer. We're going to maintain the same settings for everything. If I don't drop my camera, that'd be great. Five, six, so we need to go up a little bit. Seven, seven. All right, I'll just move in. So we're going to do one more. Now watch how dark the background will get. One, two, three. Yeah, so again, I don't own a gray background, and that's only, we're only like four or five feet away from the background. So if you want to shoot and make a white background gray, it's, it's a lot easier than making a gray background white, which is pretty much impossible unless you just want to blow it out. So. Uh, I only own white backgrounds because it's so much easier for me to make it gray. And it's a good lesson to know when people do, when people do ask is, you can make a white background white with one light, you just need to position the light accordingly. So move your light away from your subject and that fall off will be less and the background will be whiter. So Joe, I'm gonna have you take one step back. Um, I'm actually, John, I'm gonna have you hold this light almost directly to the side and now we're going to have no light on the background. So yeah, maybe just a little bit higher and angle it down right in there. Um, actually, I'll meter. And we're going to continue to shoot at f8 just because I think consistency is important when we're learning about this stuff. 4, 5, we've got to go up a little bit. All right, we're at f8. So yes, uh, I'm going to have you stand straight on, head towards the light just a little bit right in there. And it's feathered a little bit in front of him. We shouldn't be, we'll get a little bit of a gradient on the background. Um, you might, I'll have you aim that just a, oh, there we go, that works. Um, so you can see, still the exact same light, still F8, everything's the same. Um, now, if this is a t situation where you don't like that shadow on the background, if you think it's distracting, this is a case where we can move. Yeah, if you just wanna raise that up. I'm actually gonna move everything in sync here. So we're gonna get rid of that shadow. That's high enough, yeah. Um, Feather it just how you had it. And I'm actually going to have you take a huge step forward. And I'm going to take a huge step backwards. So we're going to get rid of that shadow by moving him further from the background. So we'll take a blast at F8 here. And normally on shoots, I don't meter this much. But I think when teaching and trying to explain things, it's important to be consistent and accurate. So I just want all of them to be at the right setting. So same thing, how you were looking off this way. Frame, we were about the knees up. So same idea here. Boom, F8. And now we should get rid of that shadow. So again, we didn't change anything. This is the same light as this. Um, and now, I, along with the same lines of fall off, notice how, you know, if we want to light more evenly from head to toe, all we have to do is angle this down. I like what we did there, but this is the same idea as our background. So the other way in which you can use fall off to your advantage is uh, re-angling the light. We're going to leave it right here. We're going to angle it downwards. And I'm going to feather it in front just about how we had it. Does that look similar? Similar enough? Uh, nothing should have changed. We can, we can meter just for fun. Um, all right, bingo. 6-3. Six, 6-3. Three. Six, three. So we'll go up a few clicks. Should be about 8, 9. All right, we're good. We went. We'll call it good. So I'm going to continue to use the same frame. But what this is going to do this one should have a little more light on his hands, but then I'm going to show you the real magic after that with full lighting. One, two, three. All right, so we've angled it downwards, a little more evenly lit. Uh, his shoulder blade and, and forehead are just a little bit brighter than hands, but the same thing is true when you're lighting a white background as when you're lighting a person from head to toe. His forehead is still what we're exposing for, but that light fall off from this distance is about three feet, this distance is about four or five, so all we need to do move the light up higher to maintain that angle as we move it back. So you'll see now, 
Uh, stay. Uh, we'll meter one more time. Let me pop the power up. I know we're going to have to. We're going for F8. Boom. Eight. Eight. We're going to keep the same frame. And now he should be a little more evenly lit from head to toe. And I bet our background might even get a tad bit brighter. Yep. So there you go. So by moving the light away from him, we have you know, a little more even light and the background got brighter. So it's the same thing. It's all about where you position your light relative to where you're metering. Further away it is, the less fall off you're going to have. So the more your light's going to extend into the frame. Think about this. If you were lighting a family of four with one light and you have dad over here and kid and kid and mom and you have one light off to the side, if your light is close to dad, he's going to be really lit. Pretend that your mom is the background over here like we just did, she's going to be dark. So the key is to get that light as far away as possible so you get nice even lighting across everybody. So that's another way to think of it. Uh, so it can be, I mean, the inverse square law is relative to, and very useful when lighting backdrops and groups of people with one light. You can obviously put the light right in front, but if you are trying to get that shadow, you just need to move the light further away so that distance is uh, affecting the fall off a lot. Does that make sense? Any questions about anything? I have a question about metering. Yes. Um, I've never used a meter, well, years ago when I shot film, but uh, I use a histogram and mm -hmm. I test shot and I look at the histogram on my camera. Is there an advantage that a meter could give me that reading my histogram doesn't? I mean, your histogram is just showing, you know, the highlights on the right and the shadows on your left. I Rather than do that, I like to use the meter because I like to just see exactly the spot. You know, let's say something else within your image is brighter or darker your histogram can change. So I like to use the meter because it's spotlighting the exact spot that I want to be exposed properly. So by metering on his forehead, which is where the, you know, the center of interest I want, that's going to tell me exactly what, what the light's going to be at the point where I want it. We're looking at a histogram. If, depending on your situation, if you're lighting someone on a white background and you're lighting the background independently, your histogram is going to shift to the right a lot and show really bright, but they, they might not have a lot of light on them. So by using a meter, you can specifically tell where, where the light is at your proper aperture within the frame. Does that make sense? We're going to do a couple more right back here on white. That, uh, so we'll just continue on. I'm actually just going to leave it on the stand. And we're going, to, we're going to play with shadow just a little bit more. And then we'll move on to the next setup. So we're going to, we're going to keep this angle. The background, since he's so close, we don't need to worry about light. Uh, quite as much because uh, the background is going to go white either way. We're going to keep that angle. I'm going to angle the light downward so we get that nice fall off so he's a little more evenly lit from head to toe. And we'll do one meter pop real quick. We're still going to go with F8. That's got to be too bright. Yep. Um, we'll go down a stop. Nine. A little bit more. See, it doesn't even make sense. It's because it's bouncing off everything. So we're going to, sometimes it's like I went down two tenths of a stop and it said I went down yeah. two thirds. So we'll call it uh, seven. seven. We'll call it good. We're only off by less than a third of a stop. So what I want to do now is I'm actually going to have you turn away from the camera and I'm going to have you looking back over your shoulder, almost like you're looking towards this light head over here. Yeah, so how many of you guys know what short lighting is versus broad lighting? whoever was not in my class this morning because everybody knows it, who was there. Uh, short lighting is when you light the short side of the face. So if we're looking right at Joe right now, our light is coming from camera left and hitting his face. His nose is turned towards the light. So that means when we're looking at him, there's a short side to his face and there's a broad side to his face. So if I'm looking at you guys, the short side of my face is now this little side and the broad side is this whole side. So generally speaking, uh, for more flattering light, you're going to want to short light people, so light them from the short side, or turn their nose towards the light, and that'll be a little more flattering. Um, you can control light that way. A lot of times with guys, you can get away with more masculine uh, broad lighting, so we're going to do both of those right now just to show you the difference. So I'm going to have you turn just how you are. We already metered, so we don't need to do that again. All right, one, two. We're having focus issues here at three. So this is short lit. Um, you can just see how his face falls into shadow over here. Ignore the, ignore the shadow on the wall. We're not really talking about that right now. You can see how his face goes into shadow on the broad side. So he is short lit. Now I'm going to have you almost look towards the door. A little less, maybe right out in here. Yep. So now you'll see how much 
more light his face will take. So we have, uh, he's more broad lit. So you can see his, he can pull that off with his look and it actually fits the wardrobe and everything else, the styling, to have it broad lit. It adds that, that punch to it. Um, so short light, looking into the light, it just, it slenders the face, you know, it's a little more flattering. But broad lighting, you can see it's wider. Um, the shadow is now on the short side. So it's just different lighting. You gotta really look at your subject and who you're photographing to know what works for them. So what we're gonna do next is, you can relax for a second, we're gonna, we're gonna switch from this type of small, small reflector source, and we're actually gonna go to a larger source, which is the silver umbrella. So we're gonna stay in the same family of having nice specular light, but we're gonna have a much larger source. So we'll have more room to work with, uh, the light will have a little less fall off, and uh, I guess I don't need to take that off because we're using a different light. So we'll wheel this guy out of here. All right, so now we have the Pro Photo Deep Silver Medium Umbrella. So this is probably somewhere around a 42 inch umbrella. I'm just guessing uh, just by looks. I'm gonna raise that up a little bit. And uh, you know, it's a bounce umbrella, silver, definitely has a little bit of texture. So this is gonna throw off a lot of light. It's gonna be hard. Um, it's not gonna be soft light by any means, but it is gonna have, a, it is a much larger source. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna, Actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have you turn this so we can put the light closer to him without having this in the shot. So if you just wanna yeah. flip the arm yeah. one way or the other, or even flip the head around. Actually do that, flip the head around. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the light really close to him and then slowly move it away so you can see the difference in specularity and how the quality of light changes. Um, yeah, that's just about, we'll lean it out just a little bit more. I'm gonna lean it towards you. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, if you want to adjust it up that way. Because what I want to do is I want to keep that same height, that, you know, that 35 degree angle, but I want to feather that light downwards. And we really want to keep the hot spot of the light off of our subject. So I never, step up this way once. Uh, actually, we'll go way out here. We'll just get away from the background. Um, I never light anybody by just full on blasting them with the center of the umbrella or a soft box especially because that gives you that horrible hot spot. You know, you look at a photo of someone and they have this shiny spot on their forehead, nose or cheek. A lot of times you can minimize that by feathering your light properly. So this light's hard because it's so, it's so harsh. But what we can do is uh, I like to feather my light, meaning I like to have the brunt of my light aimed in front of the subject, especially with that big white umbrella, which we'll see in a little bit. So I'll, I'll put the back edge of the umbrella roughly at uh, Joe's ear and let all the light in front wrap around. So we're gonna do a shot like this. The background should be fairly dark. We'll hope for F8, it's gonna be way too bright. Yep. And we'll pop another one, I'm guessing hopefully close. Woohoo. All right, so this is, uh, it's about medium distance. So we'll do this. So you can actually stand, I'm gonna have you turn towards the light a little bit. There you go. And just looking almost straight ahead towards the K in photo week down there, yep. So I'm gonna be about here, low angle. We're gonna get just underneath the hands cropped up. The light's in the shot, but that's okay. So you can see here, this is just a different quality of light. It's because it's, it has a little more wrap, it's not getting as much on the background. So again, I didn't buy gray seamless. We can just make this go really dark. And in fact, if we want it to go darker, we can feather this even more. I'm gonna have you step up a tiny bit towards me. Same thing, not, not much should change as far as exposure. One, two, three and you'll see the, the background will go even darker. So look at that, you can see the light in the shot, but uh, you know, we didn't change anything here other than the angle and the distance we are. So the light's close to our subject, the subject's far from the background, that makes the background go darker. So it's just another way to, uh, to work with your white, your white background. Now the thing I wanna do is I wanna move this light around more frontal, because what you'll see is this light will cast a similar shadow. I'm gonna take one step back. Uh, we'll flip this guy around. If you want to grab that knob, I'll grab the light. And we're just going to turn it because I'm going to shoot from directly under it. And uh, we'll raise it up just a little bit. How are we looking there? Pretty good? So I'm going to try and minimize the shadow that's on his cheek. And uh, I'm actually, so right now this is aimed right at his face. I want to feather it downward more. So I'm just going to go ahead, aim it down. Um, so we can minimize that hot spot because this umbrella will definitely cause a hot spot. If we want a meter, one, two, three, nine, nine. all right, eight. 
Perfect. So this will change a little bit. Our background will obviously get brighter because we changed the light angle. One, two, three. There we go. So we didn't change a whole lot other than the angle of the light, but you can just see how much, you know, it's all personal preference at this point, but starting with a solid foundation of proper light height, uh, I mean, I'm, I'd be pretty happy with a shot like this. In fact, I want to do one more, uh, one more in my notes like that. So what we're going to do is create essentially the same shot, but what I want to do is show you how a lot of people with that would say, oh, but there's just a little too much, a little too much shadow. And you can definitely minimize that. I'm going to have you take one big step forward. You can definitely minimize that by just uh, simply adding a white reflector. So if you want to grab that reflector, John, we're going to go similar angle. We're feathered down. I'm going to bring the light down just a little bit so we can maintain that height. We're going to feather it nicely in front of him. Uh, we will meter without the reflector. It doesn't really matter because we're only metering from the main light side. Nine. Nine. All right, one more. All right, so let's take one shot without the reflector. So we're going to have no reflector here. We're going to have a nice dark background, good dramatic shadow. One, two, three. Perfect. There we go. Nice clean light. Now, you don't need a second light if you don't like the shadow. Uh, I'm going to take a tiny step back right there. Perfect. We're going to keep that just. So the only thing we're changing is reflector. No lights. And you can see, just if you just look at his arm, uh, and the side of his face, you know, he doesn't even have a left ear in this photo, but doing something so simple as a white reflector where a lot of people think they need to add in a second light. The reason why I try and not add a second light when possible is because it just adds another level of confusion. Um, even though you might be using two Profoto B1 heads and they have the same numbers on the back, you know, this one says 5.7, a lot of people think, and they're totally wrong, that if you put a second light here, with another umbrella, okay, this one's 5.7, so if this one's 4.7, it's a stop down. No, because look at, this one's three feet from him, this one's six feet, that one might have a silver umbrella, this one might have a white umbrella. All those things factor in, so you need to meter then for two lights, and you start talking about lighting ratios and all that. If you can just throw in a white foam core, reflector, V-flat, anything like that, you can, you can get a lot of shadow filled in. Um, and we could move definitely closer. That was on a three-quarter length shot, so you can do a lot with one light and a white reflector. So, all right. So that's embracing shadow and contrast, kind of going over everything that we can do from one light. Um, she is fully backed up against leaning against that wall, so that's why we keep the shadow so tight. Uh, we can't do that on seamless. But uh, you know, that's just what I do to control background lighting, control shadow, and things like that using two fairly hard light sources that most people would avoid. Um, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but this was that bare bulb flash, or basically, basically bare bulb flash, if not more harsh, with that silver reflector. And I think the light quality is still there, because if you place your light properly, if you meter, and if you control it, and know how you want to control your background, you can do great things with just one light. Um, I think we had that shot, and then we moved it further away, so if you look at where his hands are, dark, light, and that was just by moving the light just a little bit away. So you can control a lot if you understand the fundamentals and the conceptual level of lighting and how it affects. Again, that was the same light as you know, something like this, but all we change is the angle and the position. And you can, you can alter a lot, uh, and you can make your white background go gray. And that's another shot. That was with this same silver umbrella. She was leaning against a white wall. There's obviously been a little more editing here than what we're doing with these raw files. But that was just a white wall in my studio. One umbrella, the silver one, you can see it's the same shadow. Uh, same idea, one light. So for the everyday portraits, these are going to be totally different. Uh, what I want to do here is almost create a nice soft north facing window light. So it's the exact opposite of what we just did with the uh, small sources and the specular sources. So this is just going to show the full range of what you can do with one light. Uh, they're softer, more flattering light. In this case, we'll be using either a white beauty dish or a uh, big pro photo umbrella. So we're going to do both of those because they're white sources, they're not silver. And we're going to show how you can control light with the grid. But first off, we're going to show just the biggest, softest source we have, which is, I don't know, that's about a 60, 60 some inch umbrella. 65 inch umbrella with white diffusion. So nothing about it screams hard light. It is just, it's just basically creating nice soft window light. So again, to create 
create these lights, you're going to want large light sources. And another thing to consider, I'll get people that email me and they'll say, oh, I just lit this portrait with a six foot softbox. However, it still is really hard light. And I say, well, how close was the light? And a lot of times they were in a big room like this and they're lighting me, but the light's over by that camera. Well, essentially, once you figure in that distance, uh, that softbox is not that big anymore. If you really think about it, the sun is like a gajillion miles in diameter. So shouldn't that be like the softest light? No, because it's so far away. So you have to keep that distance uh, in mind because just because you're using a large light source does not mean it's actually a soft source. So keeping your large light source close to your subject is key to really using it to its true potential. So what we're going to do next is we're going to, the white, the background we're not going to worry about so much, just going to go kind of soft gray. We're going to feather the light the exact same in, in front of Joe. You can take one step forward. So I want this, and I'm going to have you take one step this way slightly. I want this light to really wrap around and be soft. So again, we're going to feather the back of this about even with the front of his face. We're going to, you can see with an umbrella where your light's pointing to know that when it's pointing directly at someone or not. Clearly this is pointed almost at you guys. So we are not getting any, any direct light on him. It's all wrap. We're going to keep shooting at f8. So we can, let me, let me look at one thing here. I think I have one more slide, sorry. Um, oh, and a white reflector for bounce. So we're going to throw that back in there because that's another way to really soften that up. Uh, this is one more shot of just one light with a white reflector in studio on a white background, believe it or not. So she was just really far away from that background. And we'll do something like this here as well. All right, so let's meet her. You already, already on? Oh, look at that. All right, so we're going we're gonna to use the white background here, and we're going to do, this will look totally different than the last shot. So one, two, three. All right, so we're bringing that in. So now you can just see how much softer the gradation is from highlight to shadow. And if we want to get real crazy, I'm going to get in close. So just looking right into camera, nose this way ever so slightly, and a little less. One, two, three. All right, so you'll be able to really see how soft that light is. You know, again, one light, we metered properly, it's positioned properly at that near 35 degree angle, feathered in front of him. Um, so we're getting that nice soft light. I wanna have you move even closer to the light. So the closer he gets, go like almost so you're touching. Yep, we're gonna have to meter again though, John, cause he just cut the distance by about half. 11. 11, so we gotta go down one full stop. Nine, Nine. we'll call this good. All right, so right there. So I'm going to be in real close, and you'll just see how soft this light can get just by distance alone. One, two, three. You know, and also, look, we moved the light closer to him. Look what happened. Background. So you have that nice, soft light. Uh, you can see a little bit of it in there. But then if you want to do the opposite, you can just move that. I'm going to have you stay right there. John, grab that white reflector, and we're going to make... This would be an image that you could would be flattering on anybody. So this is something I would use for just about any, any type of portrait situation that required nice soft light. So this is, the background's still gonna be gray, but by shooting with both the umbrella and that, look at the difference, ready? The shadow, all we did was throw in that reflector. And look at that, you, couldn't get, you can't get much softer light than that. So again, one light, one pro photo head, just using a different modifier and a reflector, and you can get something that looks like he's standing next to a north a north facing window. So uh, I like doing things like that as well, just because they give a little different result. And again, you don't need to overcomplicate things by, by adding a second light. Just checking my notes here. Uh, so you can take a step back real quick. I wanna do one more thing with this. I'm actually gonna move this quite, quite a ways away. I'm gonna have you about three feet from the background. We're gonna move this way out here. And what I wanna do now is get uh, it'll still be somewhat soft light, but I want to show you guys how we can make that white background again, uh, how we can use this large source and light somewhat evenly uh, by still feathering the light and using something like this. So uh, I'll, yep, there you go. John's on it. Seven. One more. One more. We're almost there. Fancy, fancy light meter there. Yeah, and if any of you guys get a light meter, um, just to show you, this one's the touchscreen one. Awesome in theory, but have you ever butt dialed someone with your iPhone? I have butt dialed the ISO on this thing to like 40,000 and then light metered and couldn't figure out what was wrong. So be sure to turn it off before you uh, put it in your pocket. It's, it's one of the not so great perks of that light. All right, so what we have here, we're back at F8. Our light is now 
before we were like literally 10 inches away from him with that light. Now we're closer to like seven feet. So the fall off's gonna be a lot less. We're gonna light from head to toe. The background should get quite a bit brighter. We're still at F8. Uh, you can see, so even though we're using the exact same, this is the same light source. Boom, boom. A lot different style of light just because of distance. But look how white the background is. John, I'm gonna have you throw that white reflector just outside of frame. In fact, just for kicks, throw the silver side. And we're gonna try to almost flat light him with one light. Um, all right, one, two, three. So, you know, we went from, from this to this to the, I mean, mostly from this to this, just by throwing a reflector. So again, a lot of people would probably guess this was two lights or something like that, especially with a white background. I'm gonna do one more, go with the white side of it real quick and do a little bit closer up. All right, there. Uh, you're in frame just a little bit. Yep, perfect. One, two, three. All right, great. So this will be more of a white backdrop, one light. I wanna do this one more time without a reflector. Looking right here, same crop, one, two, three just to show you guys the difference. So again, just that white background and a little bit of difference. And you know, the more you move the, the reflector closer or further away, the more it's gonna change. So it works out either way. We'll turn this guy off. The thing about the beauty dish, the main part I wanna talk about is using grids with one light. So while, while all we've been doing this whole time was spilling light all over the room, um, grids can really help you uh, control the spread of your light. So this is a beauty dish, which is our white reflector. Um, it actually has a 25 degree grid. So if you ever wanna know where a grid spread is, anywhere that you can see me, so you guys can see me right in the middle. Tell me when you can't see me anymore through the grid. Okay, so that right there is the spread of my light. So anytime you're looking into the light, you can tell where the spread's gonna hit if you can see the light through the grid. I mean, not literally the light, but the inside of the beauty dish. So it's a good way to be able to know. Um, obviously the tighter, the lower the number, the tighter the grid. So I have grids all the way down to seven and a half degrees, which is a narrow beam and up to about 40 degrees. So we're gonna use the beauty dish here to really show you, we're gonna make this background just completely black. So we're gonna step this way, show you can come forward quite a bit. And a, the thing about a beauty dish, I enjoy using beauty dishes from pretty close to the subject because despite their name, they're not necessarily the most beautiful light. They are a good quality of light, but they don't work on everybody. They'll work well for this. So I'm actually gonna broad light Joe, looking off towards, uh, towards the W in, in week. So even turn your chin even more that way. So uh, keep going with shoulders too. Right in there, that's perfect. And we're gonna try and minimize all light spills. So I'm still gonna feather the beauty dish downwards a little bit. Um, we're a little low on my height, so we're gonna raise that up to maintain that proper lighting angle. And with this grid and this beauty dish, we should be able to uh, kill all spill and just make this background. 3.2. 3.2, well that'll do it too. So we gotta go way up. Uh, try it again. 5.6. Five, 5.6, six. Five, six. and a grid also kills a lot of light um, because it's that black, that black grid. 6.3. 8. 8. And just for reference, this thing is at 8.8 .8 power and we're measuring 8.8, .8. that's directly pointed at him through a grid. I don't remember, just for, if you wanna lower that, I'll grab this part, teamwork here. All right, just for reference, this is a bounce umbrella with a huge source and that was only four tenths of a stop brighter to get the same. So a grid really eats a lot of light. Um, we'll turn that off just in case. So what I wanna do now is make this backdrop go black by controlling the light. So we're gonna have pretty, pretty dramatic light here. One, two, three. Look at that. So we're using the exact same room, exact same everything, but our background is, it's pretty well black. And uh, the only thing we did different was throw a grid on that light to control it. But look at the quality of light because we metered. I'm actually gonna have you do the same thing, but looking with your, I love the facial position this way but eyes almost to camera. Yep, right there. So one, two, three, there we go. Just get a little more eye contact. So just to see the, the catch light and everything like that. Now what I'm gonna do is show you how you can use a little bit of an accent light by just using a reflector.
I'm going to have you stand back here so you're not so much reflecting onto his face, but almost creating a little bit of a rim light. Yep, so keeping that, as long as we keep it from the subject and behind, so as long as this is clear, the light won't affect his face so much. And we'll get a nice rim light. Uh, John, I'm going to have you turn it just a little bit more this way so it's not in frame. Perfect, thank you. All right, uh, head out this way more with your nose, eyes to camera. Chin up a tiny bit, one, two, three. And look at that, we have, you can see it on his neck especially, and ear, we're even creating a little bit of a second catch light there. We're just going from there to there. Look at his shoulder, creating that separation. Um, again, we didn't add a second light, we just added a silver reflector. So it's just something different you can do. There's a little bit of a distracting catch light in his eye, if you notice that, see that one? So what we can do there, move back, yep, John will just move back a little bit. Even further, uh, right there, perfect. Angle it towards, towards Joe just a little bit. All right, one, two, three. I might have got a little bit of the background, but it doesn't matter because it's black. So here we go. That looks really cool. Uh, you can just see a hint of rim light. If you look at his ear, look at it here, the ear that's in shadow versus here. It's just a hint that if you want to move closer with your reflector and you can do more. Um, but that's basically, yep. We've got a question from online. Yeah. Uh, Chandra says, when would you use a white reflector? When would you use a silver reflector? Okay. Does one throw harder so, light? Yeah, so exactly. It's the same thing of when you would use a white umbrella versus sil silver. When you need more specularity and a little more pop from your reflector, use the silver side because cool. it's going to reflect a greater amount of light than if you use the white side. Um, similar to if, if you're someone who uses natural light and you're out shooting in wide open sun, a lot of times you use the white side of your reflector, but if you're in open shade, you might use the silver side because you're trying to pull a little more light off that reflector and put it back onto your subject. So it just depends on what you're going for. But yeah, it's a good question. Uh, any other questions here? So uh, with the beauty dish, yes, uh, there was no orange light before the flash, like not orange light, the daylight can oh the modeling yeah, light? Light, yeah. yeah um that won't affect anything at all with the shot okay that'll only that'll only ha if you were if we didn't have any of these lights on the only reason i would have that on is to be able to focus but it'll that modeling light is so dim and it goes off when you hit the flash that it won't affect the shot at all i want to do one more thing with with using this grid what we're going to do is joe i'm going to have you move back about two steps and i'm going to follow you and i'm just going to show you the difference with using this grid and not so uh, you will see a little bit of a shadow cast here. Take it one step forward. And we're going to light this pretty neutral, about 45 degrees around our little uh, perimeter here, our lighting radius. We'll go back to F8. Um, if I, I think I hid the meter from you. Here we go. Should be ready to measure. Boom. Twelve and a half, got to go down, stop in a third. Oops, that might have done something funky. Just seven, just two thirds, two spots. Yep, eight. Eight, so what I want to do is I want to shoot this just as is. The background will be a little bit gray. It might have a weird vignette on it due to the beauty dish. Uh, looking right here, one, two, three. Yep, so essentially it's the same light as what we had in the last shot, but the background's catching a little light. Now I want to take that grid off and show you what the real power of the grid is. So you'll notice we were just at F8. I'm not going to change the power of the light, so we're going to truly know how much, how much light we lose by putting a grid on there. So we went from F8 to F10, so it took off two-thirds of a stop. So what I need to go down is two-thirds. Uh, measure one more time. We should be golden here. Boom. Eight. That's what we want. All right, so let's do the exact same shot. All right, one. And our background's going to get lighter, and we're going to have a lot less, or we're going to have a lot more spill. So there you go. All we did was take off that grid, and look what happened. So it's just a totally different look um, and, and a different way to use the beauty dish. If you want less of that spot on the background, you just got to move the light away or angle it more towards the background. Um, but really, that's that. When I'm messing around in my studio, experimenting and trying to like kind of add to the the knowledge that I have and and situations that I can handle by knowing, okay, I'm confined to this small space with one light. What can I do? How can I make this background brighter or darker? How can I move the shadows? How can I take a dramatic image? How can I make a softer image? It's all about what you know about the parameters of one light. So again, just to go over the full range, 
uh, we went from one light up close, one light changing the background color, changing the angle of shadow, uh, changing our, we never changed our background and we never changed our apertures throughout this entire, or our camera settings in general throughout the entire exercise, but yet we changed so much within the shot all by using just one light and knowing how to manipulate that light to fit the mood we want. Um, you know, so we have the full, the full range and the, my favorite part being the techie nerd I am is that every shot is perfectly exposed because taking the time to meter really takes off the time that you have on the back end. I know I just did image critique over the lunch hour and so many of the, so many of the images are either overexposed or underexposed and for me it's like, oh, you, were, you just gotta push one button on your light meter and you would handle all that um, because I haven't done anything to these at all and yet we have this full range of images without having spent any time on the computer other than me clicking through and we have a lot of variances. So I think it's pretty fun to play around with. It's amazing what you can do with one light so don't let anybody tell you that you need to buy all the gear in the world even though sometimes I'll, that's fun too. Um, Alexis will tell you that in the back of the room. Uh, any questions by the way now that we're totally done with all the studio stuff? Uh, you mentioned in that one picture of the girl with the white wall and the shadow that you'd done some editing yep. on that. So I'm curious, um, how much of the white in the backdrop are you able to achieve so in studio? Do you? Yeah, so I mean, for this particular image, uh, this light was fairly square to the wall. There's a little bit of a shadow. So if you follow the shadow backwards, the light's about here. And I believe I was using a silver umbrella, just like the one that's now collapsed over there. So most of it, I'd say there might have been a small vignette out here that went gray, but it was nothing that didn't take a minute in Photoshop to fix, you know, at most. So it was because I had metered for her and she was so close to the wall. The wall was pretty well white. I'm, I'm almost positive it had vignetted off a little bit on the side, but this is just so because since we just did it, this is actually a shot of one light with that exact pro photo beauty dish with the grid outside of, of this guy. His name was Luis sitting on the stairs in New York City. So just, just a one light shot balancing that with ambient. So, um, you know, you can do a lot with one light. Um, I always take it on location. So a lot of people ask me, and that's a whole nother lesson, but I just want to give you guys a quick intro. So what you can do is anytime I'm shooting on location where I'm balancing ambient light, whether it's sunlight, whether it's uh, in the lobby of a bank for a business portrait, anything like that. I like to just take one light because I don't like to confuse myself and add in those extra variables. You already have enough going on when you're shooting. A, this kid was about 10 years old in a park. There's already enough stuff changing that if I just have one light to worry about, I don't have to deal with you know managing two lights, managing the wind with the different types of equipment. And that's another reason I like to take the beauty dish on location outside is if it's windy, that thing doesn't catch a lot of wind, where if I were to take that outside, it's like parasailing. So you need a second assistant and a bunch of sandbags to control it. So knowing how I can manipulate a beauty dish to control the light, you don't necessarily need to take out a big light if you can, if you can control the distance and things like that. So it's knowing how to use that one light and put it to your advantage and make it work for you. That'll let you know what you can take outside. And the other cool thing about taking a light outside is you already have natural fill. You have ambient light from the sun. So similar to how we introduced that white reflector here, you always have that outside. It's just a matter of if you want to overpower it or not. So the way you can you know, open up more light is just lowering your shutter speed and things like that outside, which will let in more of that ambient so you can fill shadows naturally. Uh, or you can take a white reflector outside and do the same thing. So it's, it's, not, it's not as hard as it sounds. It is a whole nother lesson, but anytime, I've just had a lot of people ask me, anytime I shoot outside on location, 99% of the time, it's one light plus whatever already existed. So I like to keep it simple and not confuse myself. Question. Can you talk about the difference or the pros and cons of a speed light versus a Pro Photo B1? Um, yeah, so the difference is for one power, a speed light you know, generally has a lot less power than a B1. A B1's 500 watts. And here's a, another thing to mention about that. People have asked me, um, because I take my B2s on location a lot because I like how small it is. I like that I can almost use this as a little bit of a weight and use the head, which is so lightweight. The B2 is 250 watts. I don't know what a speed light is exactly for wattage. Um, anybody know that? It's, it's significantly less just based on the size of the flash. So the B2 is 250 watts, that's 500. That's only one stop difference. Every time you double the power of your light, it's one stop. So a lot of people think, I have the B2s or I have a speed light. I can't, 
overpower the sun? Well, for one thing, you can use high-speed sync with a lot of those things. Secondly, the difference between that light and that light might seem like it is 250 watts, but that's only one stop because you're doubling the power. So you're talking about a difference of shooting at f5.6 versus f8. Not that big of a deal. If you use a, you know, a neutral density filter or you know, if you can use high-speed sync or anything like that, the power of the light doesn't matter. It's all about the modifier. So if, for your speed light, if you can put that into a softbox and get that same quality of light. Um, you saw in the, when we shot with the bare bulb flash, we still had great quality of light from a tiny, a tiny light source. It's all about positioning it. So I think being able to practice where you're putting that speed light and how you're metering, you know, that it probably works through TTL and other things too to get you close. Um, but other, I mean, I don't necessarily think it matters the light you have, it's how you use it and knowing that that fundamental knowledge of, okay, I have the right height, I have the right angle, because that's half the battle. I see so many images doing critiques where the second you look at it, it's like, well, the light's in a horrible position. Had you had that fundamental knowledge where you were already off to a better start, like there's still other things that we can tweak. But as far as lighting, I just think it's so important to start with that, that main light and know the fundamentals of where to put it and how that'll affect your shot. Because there wasn't any magic we did with shooting Joe, it was just, taking our time, doing the technical part right, and understanding the fundamentals. So I, that was a really long answer to a short question, but there you go. Uh, any other questions about any of this? Got some questions online. Yeah, let's them. hear them. All right. Do you use the same exposure for subjects of different skin tones? How do you handle that? Uh, well, you always, the exposure is just a meeting, uh, reading on your meter. Mm -hmm. So if you're exposing for like, yeah, darker skin will absorb more light, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, it's gonna be close enough that you're, you're gonna expose the same. So had I had somebody of a much darker skin tone than Joe, I still would've been metering at F8. Okay. Um, you can always up the shadows and things like that within your raw you know, mm -hmm. adjustments, but yeah, I always shoot at the same, whatever my meter tells me, that's what my camera and lights are gonna be set for because I trust that guy because he only has the one job and he's not wrong often. Yeah. On a real shoot, how much, how much of a help or distraction is the tethered feedback for the model? Um, so it, it depends. That's a great question because sometimes when I shoot tethered and the model's over here, we're doing one of these. Yep. Because they don't need to know. I don't, you know, if I know that they're looking great, I don't need them to worry about it. And right. generally speaking, it depends on the type of shoot. If it's, if it's a, a shoot where I'm dependent on client feedback and their approval, a lot of times they'll, I'll want them to look at the monitor often. Mm -hmm. It's just really, it's really depends on the type of the shoot. Um, I enjoy it personally because it gives me the feedback to know, okay, I need to move this way. Looking at things like catch lights and all that type of stuff. I still have him on this monitor, so I'm looking back and he's not there. But, you know, having, having catch lights and things like that, that's why I like looking at it. But mm -hmm. uh, it depends on, on the subject, who you're shooting, and if you want them to see it or not. Because it, it ranges. There's no real cool. answer to that question. So whatever makes it easier. Whatever makes it easier and less of a distraction. And other yeah. people don't want to see it at all. So right. that's, that's fine by me. I just cool. like to see it to get the feedback of know that everything's syncing up how I want it and looking how I, how I want it to look. Totally. How about if you were using one light to shoot a group of five or six people? Uh, that's gonna do that? All that's going to come down to is lighting position and distance. You know, okay. if, you're, if you're trying to get some sort of shadow, so meaning you want your light off to one side, that light's going to have to be really far away to light a group of six. Mm -hmm. If you're not so worried about shadow and you want to more flat light it, now you're working on a flat plane of six people, you can have that light directly in front and you're going to light everybody fairly evenly. So mm -hmm. it just depends. If I'm trying to light a group of five people with even light, put it directly over your camera or a little off to the side, get a decent distance away and shoot. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you are wanting to add some sort of shadow, you're going to have to get that light pretty far out so that way the fall off from the first person to the last person is not so great that you know you can't fix it later in Photoshop or mm -hmm in your raw processing because like obviously you noticed I like to try and get clean images in camera so that right. way I don't have to sit on the computer all night. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you meter towards the light or towards the camera? I meter meeting? towards the light okay. because that's where that's where it's coming from. Um, and when I'm using two lights, I'll do the same thing. I'll if I have one light here, you know, and then I'm filling, I'll meter on both sides of the person to get the <laughs> shadow side versus the highlight side just for light ratios and things like that. But I'm always metering towards the light. Okay. Sort of a technical question. If you're shooting outdoors, backlit at shallow depth of field and your <coughs> shutter speed is greater than the sync speed, does your light meter get an accurate reading with the strobe set at HSS? 
That was like some weird, weird riddle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't yeah. know, train A beat train yeah. B. Yeah, totally. um, actually, say that one more time. Yeah, totally. So if you're shooting outdoors, um, backlit, yep. at a sh really using a really shallow depth of field, uh -huh. and your shutter speed is greater than the sync speed, yep. does your light meter get an accurate reading? Yeah, because your light meter, you, can, you set the sync speed so let's say you're using, I'm guessing they're using high-speed high speed sync. Right. You're still shut, setting a shutter speed on your camera, so let's okay. say it's an 800th of a second. You just dial up an 800th mm -hmm. of a second on your light meter. Otherwise, your light meter has no idea. It's mm -hmm. just taking the info you put in and telling you an aperture or shutter speed based on that information. So you just adjust your light meter accordingly to your camera settings, and it'll always be accurate. Can I, can I answer that a minute, John? Yeah. So what's happening with the high-speed sync, the flesh is... Sorry, clock down, clock, clock down. down. The on, flash is on. firing multiple times, so some meters won't read that. I knew the new Sekonic L850 or 858 is designed to read the multiple flash. All right, so and this is why we have John. Yeah, so, so <laughs> yeah, it might not work with most light meters because the high-speed sync is pulsing the flash. All right. So. Sweet. I didn't know. I don't. I don't use high-speed sync to be honest. I like to kind of do it the old-fashioned way, where I'm still mm -hmm. at a two hundredth of a second using my aperture and ISO to control it and shutter speed, so I, even though my lights are capable and camera are capable of high-speed sync, I just, I don't know, I like doing it the old-fashioned way and, uh, and doing that. But I do love some of that shallow depth of field you can get by being able to shoot 2.8 with flash outside. It's pretty cool. Any final thoughts for us? Uh, just go back home, grab one light and a reflector, and experiment, because yeah. you won't know how things change, and you won't have a full understanding if you just try and picture it in your head. You need to actually do it, because as you move lights around, you can have those aha moments where it's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and knowing these fundamentals and going over some of the things we, we talked about will help you kind of get there a little bit more quickly without having to guess so much. So I'm all about experimenting with lights and playing around till you, till you really get it. This is just so, because since we just did it, this is actually a shot of one light with that exact pro photo beauty dish with the grid outside of, of this guy. His name was Luis sitting on the stairs in New York City. So just, just a one light shot balancing that with ambient. So, um, you know, you can do a lot with one light. Um, I always take it on location. So a lot of people ask me, and that's a whole nother lesson, but I just want to give you guys a quick intro. So, what you can do is anytime I'm shooting on location where I'm balancing ambient light, whether it's sunlight, whether it's uh, in the lobby of a bank for a business portrait, anything like that, I like to just take one light because I don't like to confuse myself and add in those extra variables. You already have enough going on when you're shooting. A, this kid was about 10 years old in a park. There's already enough stuff changing that if I just have one light to worry about, I don't have to deal with you know, managing two lights, managing the wind with the different types of equipment. And that's another reason I like to take the beauty dish on location outside is if it's windy, that thing doesn't catch a lot of wind where if I were to take that outside, it's like parasailing. So you need a second assistant and a bunch of sandbags to control it. So knowing how I can manipulate a beauty dish to control the light, you don't necessarily need to take out a big light if you can if you can control the distance and things like that. So it's knowing how to use that one light and put it to your advantage and make it work for you. That'll let you know what you can take outside. And the other cool thing about taking a light outside is you already have natural fill. You have ambient light from the sun. So similar to how we introduced that white reflector here, you always have that outside. It's just a matter of if you want to overpower it or not. So the way you can you know, open up more light is just lowering your shutter speed and things like that outside, which will let in more of that ambient so you can fill shadows naturally uh, or you can take a white reflector outside and do the same thing. So it's, it's, not, it's not as hard as it sounds. It is a whole other lesson. But anytime, I've just had a lot of people ask me, anytime I shoot outside on location, 99% of the time, it's one light plus whatever already existed. So I like to keep it simple and not confuse myself. Question. Can you talk about the difference or the pros and cons of a speed light versus a Profoto B1? Um, yeah, so the difference is, for one, power. A speed light, you know, generally has a lot less power than a B1. A B1's 500 watts. And here's a, another thing to mention about that. People have asked me, um, because I take my B2s on location a lot because I like how small it is. I like that I can almost use this as a little bit of a weight and use the head, which is so lightweight. The B2 is 250 watts. I don't know what a speed light is exactly for wattage. Um, 
Anybody know that? It's, it's significantly less just based on the size of the flash. So the B2 is 250 watts. That's 500. That's only one stop difference. Every time you double the power of your light, it's one stop. So a lot of people think, I have the B2s or I have a speed light. I can't overpower the sun. Well, for one thing, you can use high speed sync with a lot of those things. Secondly, the difference between that light and that light might seem like it is 250 watts, but that's only one stop because you're doubling the power. So you're talking about a difference of shooting at f5.6 versus f8. Not that big of a deal. If you use a, you know, a neutral density filter or you know, if you can use high speed sync or anything like that, the power of the light doesn't matter. It's all about the modifier. So if, for your speed light, if you can put that into a soft box and get that same quality of light, um, you saw in the when we shot with the bare bulb flash, we still had great quality of light from a tiny, a tiny light source. It's all about positioning it. So I think being able to practice where you're putting that speed light and how you're metering, you know, that it probably works through TTL and other things too to get you close. Um, but other, I mean, I don't necessarily think it matters the light you have. It's how you use it and knowing that that fundamental knowledge of, okay, I have the right height, I have the right angle, because that's half the battle. I see so many images doing critiques where the second you look at it, it's like, well, the light's in a horrible position. Had you had that fundamental knowledge, where you were already off to a better start. Like, there's still other things that we can tweak. But as far as lighting, I just think it's so important to start with that, that main light and know the fundamentals of where to put it and how that'll affect your shot. Because there wasn't any magic we did with shooting Joe. It was just taking our time, doing the technical part right, and understanding the fundamentals. So I, that was a really long answer to a short question, but there you go. Uh, any other questions about any of this? Got some questions online. Yeah, let's hear them. them. All right. Do you use the same exposure for subjects of different skin tones? How do you handle that? Uh, well, you always, the exposure is just a meeting, uh, reading on your meter. Mm -hmm. So if you're exposing for like, yeah, darker skin will absorb more light, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, it's gonna be close enough that you're, you're gonna expose the same. So had I had somebody of a much darker skin tone than Joe, I still would have been metering at F8. Okay. Um, you can always up the shadows and things like that within your raw you know, mm -hmm. adjustments. But yeah, I always shoot at the same, whatever my meter tells me, that's what my camera and lights are gonna be set for because I trust that guy because he only has the one job and he's not wrong often. Yeah. On a real shoot, how much, how much of a help or distraction is the tethered feedback for the model? Um, so it, it depends. That's a great question because sometimes when I shoot tethered and the model's over here, we're doing one of these. Yep. Because they don't need to know I don't, you know, if I know that they're looking great, I don't need them to worry about it. And right. generally speaking, it depends on the type of shoot. If it's, if it's a, a shoot where I'm dependent on client feedback and their approval, a lot of times they'll, I'll want them to look at the monitor often. Mm -hmm. It's just really, it's really depends on the type of the shoot. Um, I enjoy it personally because it gives me the feedback to know, okay, I need to move this way. Looking at things like catch lights and all that type of stuff. I still have him on this monitor, so I'm looking back and he's not there, but you know, having, Having catch lights and things like that, that's why I like looking at it, but uh, it depends on, on the subject, who you're shooting, and if you want them to see it or not, because it, it ranges. There's no real cool. answer to that question. So whatever makes it easier. Whatever no, makes it easier and less of a distraction. And other yeah. people don't want to see it at all, so right. that's, that's fine by me. I just cool. like to see it to get the feedback of know that everything's syncing up how I want it and looking how I, how I want it to look. Totally. How about if you were using one light to shoot a group of five or six people? Uh, that's going to you know? all that's going to come down to is lighting position and distance. You know, okay. if you're if you're trying to get some sort of shadow, so meaning you want your light off to one side, that light's going to have to be really far away to light a group of six. Mm -hmm. If you're not so worried about shadow and you want to more flat light it, now you're working on a flat plane of six people. You can have that light directly in front, and you're going to light everybody fairly evenly. So mm -hmm. it just depends. If I'm trying to light a group of five people with even light, put it directly over your camera, or a little off to the side. Get a decent distance away and shoot, mm -hmm. but if you if you are wanting to add some sort of shadow, you're going to have to get that light pretty far out, so that way the fall off from the first person to the last person is not so great that you know you can't fix it later in Photoshop or mm -hmm. in your raw processing. Because like obviously you noticed, I like to try and get clean images in camera, so that right. way I don't have to sit on the computer all night. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you meter towards the light or towards the camera? I meter towards the light okay. because that's where. That's where it's coming from. Um, and when I'm using two lights, I'll do the same thing. I'll, if I have one light here, you know, and then I'm filling, I'll meter on both sides of the person to get the shadow <laughs> side versus the highlight side just for light ratios and things like that. But I'm always metering towards the light. Okay. Sort of a technical question. If you're shooting outdoors backlit 
at shallow depth of field and your <coughs> shutter speed is greater than the sync speed, does your light meter get an accurate reading with the strobe set at HSS? That was like some weird, weird riddle. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I don't yeah. know, train A beat train yeah, B. Yeah, totally. um, actually, say that one more time. Yeah, totally. So if you're shooting outdoors, um, backlit, yep. at a sh really using a really shallow depth of field, uh -huh. and your shutter speed is greater than the sync speed, yep. does your light meter get an accurate reading? Yeah, because your light meter, you, can, you set the sync speed. So let's say you're using, I'm guessing they're using high, high speed, speed sync. Right. You're still shut, setting a shutter speed on your camera. So let's okay. say it's an 800th of a second. You just dial up an 800th mm -hmm. of a second on your light meter. Otherwise, your light meter has no idea. It's mm -hmm. just taking the info you put in and telling you an aperture or shutter speed based on that information. So you just adjust your light meter accordingly to your camera settings, and it'll always be accurate. Can I, can I add to that a minute, Yeah. So what's happening with the high speed sync, the flesh is Sorry, clock, down, clock, clock down, clock down. Come the on, flash is on. firing multiple times, so some meters won't read that. I knew the new Sekonic L850 or 858 is designed to read the multiple flash. All right, so and this is why we have John. Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, it might not work with most light meters because the high-speed sync is pulsing the flash. All right. So. Sweet. I, didn't know, I, don't, I don't use high-speed sync, to be honest. I like to kind of do it the old-fashioned way where I'm still mm -hmm. at a 200th of a second using my aperture and ISO to control it and shutter speed, so I, even though my lights are capable and camera are capable of high speed sync, I just, I don't know, I like doing it the old fashioned way and, uh, and doing that. But I do love some of that shallowed up the field you can get by being able to shoot 2.8 with flash outside, it's pretty cool. Any final thoughts for us? Uh, just go back home, grab one light and a reflector and experiment because yeah. you won't know how things change and you won't have a full understanding if you just try and picture it in your head. You need to actually do it because as you move lights around, you can have those aha moments where it's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and knowing these fundamentals and going over some of the things we, t we talked about will help you kind of get there a little bit more quickly without having to guess so much. So I'm all about experimenting with lights and playing around till you, till you really get it. This is just so, because since we just did it, this is actually a shot of one light with that exact pro photo beauty dish with the grid outside of, of this guy. His name was Luis sitting on the stairs in New York City. So just, just a one light shot balancing that with ambient. So, um, you know, you can do a lot with one light. Um, I always take it on location. So a lot of people ask me, and that's a whole nother lesson, but I just want to give you guys a quick intro. So, what you can do is anytime I'm shooting on location where I'm balancing ambient light, whether it's sunlight, whether it's uh, in the lobby of a bank for a business portrait, anything like that, I like to just take one light because I don't like to confuse myself and add in those extra variables. You already have enough going on when you're shooting. A, this kid was about 10 years old in a park. There's already enough stuff changing that if I just have one light to worry about, I don't have to deal with you know, managing two lights, managing the wind with the different types of equipment. And that's another reason I like to take the beauty dish on location outside is if it's windy, that thing doesn't catch a lot of wind where if I were to take that outside, it's like parasailing. So you need a second assistant and a bunch of sandbags to control it. So knowing how I can manipulate a beauty dish to control the light, you don't necessarily need to take out a big light if you can if you can control the distance and things like that. So it's knowing how to use that one light and put it to your advantage and make it work for you. That'll let you know what you can take outside. And the other cool thing about taking a light outside is you already have natural fill. You have ambient light from the sun. So similar to how we introduced that white reflector here, you always have that outside. It's just a matter of if you want to overpower it or not. So the way you can you know, open up more light is just lowering your shutter speed and things like that outside, which will let in more of that ambient so you can fill shadows naturally uh, or you can take a white reflector outside and do the same thing. So it's, it's, not, it's not as hard as it sounds. It is a whole other lesson. But anytime, I've just had a lot of people ask me, anytime I shoot outside on location, 99% of the time, it's one light plus whatever already existed. So I like to keep it simple and not confuse myself. Question. Can you talk about the difference or the pros and cons of a speed light versus a Profoto B1? Um, yeah, so the difference is, for one, power. A speed light, you know, generally has a lot less power than a B1. A B1's 500 watts. And here's a, another thing to mention about that. People have asked me, um, because I take my B2s on location a lot because I like how small it is. I like that I can almost use this as a little bit of a weight 
and use the head, which is so lightweight. The B2 is 250 watts. I don't know what a speed light is exactly for wattage. Um, anybody know that? It's, it's significantly less just based on the size of the flash. So the B2 is 250 watts. That's 500. That's only one stop difference. Every time you double the power of your light, it's one stop. So a lot of people think, I have the B2s or I have a speed light. I can't overpower the sun. Well, for one thing, you can use high speed sync with a lot of those things. Secondly, the difference between that light and that light might seem like it is 250 watts, but that's only one stop because you're doubling the power. So you're talking about a difference of shooting at f5.6 versus f8. Not that big of a deal. If you use a, you know, a neutral density filter or you know, if you can use high speed sync or anything like that, the power of the light doesn't matter. It's all about the modifier. So if, for your speed light, if you can put that into a soft box and get that same quality of light, um, you saw in the when we shot with the bare bulb flash, we still had great quality of light from a tiny, a tiny light source. It's all about positioning it. So I think being able to practice where you're putting that speed light and how you're metering, you know, that it probably works through TTL and other things too to get you close. Um, but other, I mean, I don't necessarily think it matters the light you have. It's how you use it and knowing that that fundamental knowledge of, okay, I have the right height, I have the right angle, because that's half the battle. I see so many images doing critiques where the second you look at it, it's like, well, the light's in a horrible position. Had you had that fundamental knowledge, where you were already off to a better start. Like, there's still other things that we can tweak. But as far as lighting, I just think it's so important to start with that, that main light and know the fundamentals of where to put it and how that'll affect your shot. Because there wasn't any magic we did with shooting Joe. It was just taking our time, doing the technical part right, and understanding the fundamentals. So I, that was a really long answer to a short question, but there you go. Uh, any other questions about any of this? Got some questions online. Yeah, let's hear them. them. All right. Do you use the same exposure for subjects of different skin tones? How do you handle that? Uh, well, you always, the exposure is just a meeting, uh, reading on your meter. Mm -hmm. So if you're exposing for, like, yeah, darker skin will absorb more light, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, it's gonna be close enough that you're, you're gonna expose the same. So had I had somebody of a much darker skin tone than Joe, I still would've been metering at F8. Okay. Um, you can always up the shadows and things like that within your raw, you know, mm -hmm. adjustments. But yeah, I always shoot at the same, whatever my meter tells me, that's what my camera and lights are gonna be set for because I trust that guy because he only has the one job and he's not wrong often. Yeah. On a real shoot, how much, how much of a help or distraction is the tethered feedback for the model? Um, so it, it depends. That's a great question because sometimes when I shoot tethered and the model's over here, we're doing one of these. Yep. Because they don't need to know I don't, you know, if I know that they're looking great, I don't need them to worry about it. And right. generally speaking, it depends on the type of shoot. If it's, if it's a, a shoot where I'm dependent on client feedback and their approval, a lot of times they'll, I'll want them to look at the monitor often. Mm -hmm. It's just really, it really depends on the type of the shoot. Um, I enjoy it personally because it gives me the feedback to know, okay, I need to move this way. Looking at things like catch lights and all that type of stuff, I still have him on this monitor, so I'm looking back and he's not there. But, you know, having, Having catch lights and things like that, that's why I like looking at it, but uh, it depends on, on the subject, who you're shooting, and if you want them to see it or not, because it, it ranges. There's no real cool. answer to that question. So whatever makes it easier. Whatever no, makes it easier and less of a distraction. And other yeah. people don't want to see it at all, so right. that's, that's fine by me. I just cool. like to see it to get the feedback of know that everything's syncing up how I want it and looking how I, how I want it to look. Totally. How about if you were using one light to shoot a group of five or six people? Uh, that's going to you know? all that's going to come down to is lighting position and distance. You know, okay. if you're if you're trying to get some sort of shadow, so meaning you want your light off to one side, that light's going to have to be really far away to light a group of six. Mm -hmm. If you're not so worried about shadow and you want to more flat light it, now you're working on a flat plane of six people. You can have that light directly in front, and you're going to light everybody fairly evenly. So mm -hmm. it just depends. If I'm trying to light a group of five people with even light, put it directly over your camera, or a little off to the side. Get a decent distance away and shoot, mm -hmm. but if you if you are wanting to add some sort of shadow, you're going to have to get that light pretty far out, so that way the fall off from the first person to the last person is not so great that you know you can't fix it later in Photoshop or mm -hmm. in your raw processing. Because like obviously you noticed, I like to try and get clean images in camera, so that right. way I don't have to sit on the computer all night. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you meter towards the light or towards the camera? I meter towards the light okay. because that's where. That's where it's coming from. Um, and when I'm using two lights, I'll do the same thing. I'll, if I have one light here, you know, and then I'm filling, I'll meter on both sides of the person to get the shadow side 
versus the highlight side just for light ratios and things like that. But I'm always metering towards the light. Okay. Sort of a technical question. If you're shooting outdoors backlit at shallow depth of field and your <coughs> shutter speed is greater than the sync speed, does your light meter get an accurate reading with the strobe set at HSS? That was like some weird, weird riddle. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I don't yeah. know, train A beat train yeah, B. Yeah, totally. um, actually, say that one more time. Yeah, totally. So if you're shooting outdoors, um, backlit, yep. at a sh really using a really shallow depth of field, uh -huh. and your shutter speed is greater than the sync speed, yep. does your light meter get an accurate reading? Yeah, because your light meter, you, can, you set the sync speed. So let's say you're using, I'm guessing they're using high, high speed, speed sync. Right. You're still shut, setting a shutter speed on your camera. So let's okay. say it's an 800th of a second. You just dial up an 800th mm -hmm. of a second on your light meter. Otherwise your light meter has no idea. It's mm -hmm. just taking the info you put in and telling you an aperture or shutter speed based on that information. So you just adjust your light meter accordingly to your camera settings and it'll always be accurate. Can I, can I answer that a minute, yeah. So what's happening with the high speed sync, the flesh is Sorry, clock, down, clock, clock down, clock down. Come the on, flash is on. firing multiple times, so some meters won't read that. I knew the new Sekonic L850 or 858 is designed to read the multiple flash. All right, so and this is why we have John. Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, it might not work with most light meters because the high-speed sync is pulsing the flash. All right. So. Sweet. I, didn't know, I, don't, I don't use high-speed sync, to be honest. I like to kind of do it the old-fashioned way where I'm still mm -hmm. at a 200th of a second using my aperture and ISO to control it and shutter speed, so I, even though my lights are capable and camera are capable of high speed sync, I just, I don't know, I like doing it the old fashioned way and, uh, and doing that. But I do love some of that shallowed up the field you can get by being able to shoot 2.8 with flash outside, it's pretty cool. Any final thoughts for us? Uh, just go back home, grab one light and a reflector and experiment because yeah. you won't know how things change and you won't have a full understanding if you just try and picture it in your head. You need to actually do it because as you move lights around and you can have those aha moments where it's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and knowing these fundamentals and going over some of the things we, we talked about will help you kind of get there a little bit more quickly without having to guess so much. So I'm all about experimenting with lights and playing around till you, till you really get it. This is just, so cause since we just did it, this is actually a shot of one light with that exact Pro Photo beauty dish with the grid outside of, of this guy. His name was Luis sitting on the stairs in New York City. So just, just a one light shot balancing that with ambient. So. Um, you know, you can do a lot with one light. Um, I always take it on location. So a lot of people ask me, and that's a whole nother lesson, but I just want to give you guys a quick intro. So what you can do is anytime I'm shooting on location where I'm balancing ambient light, whether it's sunlight, whether it's uh, in the lobby of a bank for a business portrait, anything like that, I like to just take one light because I don't like to confuse myself and add in those extra variables. You already have enough going on when you're shooting a this kid was about 10 years old in a park. There's already enough stuff changing that if I just have one light to worry about, I don't have to deal with you know, managing two lights, managing the wind with the different types of equipment. And that's another reason I like to take the beauty dish on location outside is if it's windy, that thing doesn't catch a lot of wind where if I were to take that outside, it's like parasailing. So you need a second assistant and a bunch of sandbags to control it. So knowing how I can manipulate a beauty dish to control the light, you don't necessarily need to take out a big light if you, can, if you can control the distance and things like that. So it's knowing how to use that one light and put it to your advantage and make it work for you. That'll let you know what you can take outside. And the other cool thing about taking a light outside is you already have natural fill. You have ambient light from the sun. So similar to how we introduced that white reflector here, you always have that outside. It's just a matter of if you want to overpower it or not. So the way you can you know, open up more light is just lowering your shutter speed and things like that outside which will let in more of that ambient so you can fill shadows naturally, um, or you can take a white reflector outside and do the same thing. So it's, it's, not, it's not as hard as it sounds. It is a whole nother lesson, but anytime, I've just had a lot of people ask me, anytime I shoot outside on location, 99% of the time, it's one light plus whatever already existed. So I like to keep it simple and not confuse myself.